In this video, let's talk about how international flows of goods and services and assets are related. One of the basic principles of economics is that we can trade and make everybody better off. When you specialize, you become more productive. When other people specialize, they also become more productive. If we trade together, we're able to make and consume more goods and services than if each was trying to make everything alone. The same principle applies to trade across countries. Each country can specialize in their competitive advantages and trade with one another. This way will make everybody better off. Most analysis we've done until now has assumed a closed economy. In this lecture, we'll relax that assumption and allow for an open economy. Open economies have citizens and companies that buy and sell goods and services in world product markets, and buy and sell capital assets, such as stocks and bonds, in world financial markets. To understand an open economy, we first need to understand how we measure the flow of goods and services across borders. Let me remind you of the definitions of exports and imports. Exports are goods and services produced domestically and sold abroad. Imports are the goods and services that are produced abroad and sold domestically. The value of net exports, or what we call the trade balance, is the difference between the value of exports and imports, and that is how we measure economic activities across borders. Having remembered about how we measure economic activity across borders, let's think about what factors influence a country's trade balance. I would like to put you in the perspective of a chief officer in an import and export business. Think about how each of the factors in this list would affect your bottom line. Consumer's preference for foreign and domestic goods, prices of goods at home or abroad, exchange rates at which foreign currency trades for the domestic currency, incomes of consumers at home and abroad, transportation costs, and government policies. So let's put that good thinking to work. Here are three scenarios. Please pause this video and submit your answers on top hat. So thank you for your responses. Um, let's think about scenario A. For scenario A, Canada experiences a recession. That means that incomes are falling in Canada and so is unemployment. So let's think about how the trade flow between Canada and the United States would be affected. Well, if Canadian citizens are purchasing less goods and services in general, we would expect that they also purchase less goods and services from the United States. If that was the case, the U.S. Uh, net exports would fall, since there would be less exports uh, from the United States bought in Canada. Let's think about B here. Let's correct that. That should be B. U.S. consumers decide to be patriotic and buy more products made in the U.S.A. Well, if that's the case, U.S. net exports would rise because there is a fall in imports since more people are buying domestic. And lastly, let's think about scenario C. Prices of goods produced in Mexico are rising faster than prices of goods and produce, produced in the United States. Well, in this case, that would make U.S. goods more attractive relative to Mexico's goods because they're becoming cheaper over time. If that's the case, we would expect exports to Mexico to increase. And at the same time, because the prices of goods and services in Mexico are rising, that also means they're relatively more expensive in the U.S., leading to a reduction of imports from Mexico into the United States. So now that we have some more experience with exports and imports, let me introduce the second half of international trade net capital outflow. Net capital outflow measures the change of ownership of assets across borders. When domestic residents purchase foreign assets, we say that there is an outflow of capital from the local country. On the other hand, there is an inflow of assets when foreigners purchase domestic assets. Net capital outflow 
is the difference between the purchase of foreign assets by domestic residents and the purchase of domestic assets by foreigners. It tells us how capital is moving across borders. Just like I mentioned, net capital outflow is just the other side of net exports. What you have to remember is that every trade, every purchase has two sides. When you bought lunch recently, you exchanged money, an asset, for a good and service, lunch. So on one end, you have goods and services, net exports, and on the other side, net capital outflows. Now let me illustrate how these two are equivalent by examining two different transactions. Now forgive my drawings here, but let's suppose that we have the world on one side, and the US. Now we have big container ship and this is carrying lots of containers. Right? So these are going to be imported to the US. Right? And this is again a good that is being imported. Now this is a purchase of goods and service, of goods and service. Now the other side of the transaction is an asset called currency. Let's assume there's a big stack of that there. And that is a capital inflow. because that is a foreign acquisition of US assets. So as you can see, every transaction has two sides. On one side, on the black side here, we're measuring how goods are exchanging hands across borders measure my net exports. And on the other hand, we have capital inflow and outflow measure by uh, net capital outflows. So that's the case where the US imported a good from the rest of the world. Let's think about the other side. Let's suppose that we have, again, the US and the rest of the world. Uh, you may not know this, but in fact, the U.S. is a net exporter of agricultural products. So let's suppose that the U.S. is exporting uh, agricultural products. Let's say that it's wheat. So we're exporting wheat. In that sense, that is the sale of goods and services to foreigners. And on the other hand, you have foreigners who have assets. And let's say that's a euro. Well, let's suppose that's a lot of them. And on the other side of the transaction, you have capital outflow. Because um, we, let's say the US, uh, or the US company or person making that transaction has acquired a foreign asset. So in these two transactions, you can see that there are flows of goods and services and capital. Now, the interesting thing is that even though euros are being quote unquote transferred to the US, when we're making the accounting here, the US is purchasing foreign assets. So we're thinking about this from the perspective of capital outflow, whereas when foreigners are purchasing US assets, that is a capital inflow. Just like net exports, there are factors that influence net capital outflows. Notice that because both of the list, the one for net exports and this one, are two sides of the same coin, they both affect interactions between the US and the rest of the world. This list reflects the nature of capital. 
differences in the return and risk of different capital determine whether individuals and companies would purchase them. Similarly, the ownership of local or foreign capital is determined by the return risk trade-off provided by each of them. Of course, government policies towards foreign ownership on both sides also alter the return risk trade-off and has an effect on the flow of capital across borders. So now that we've talked about the determinants of capital flows between countries, let's figure out where that capital goes. So in an open economy, nominal GDP equals to consumption plus investment plus government expenditures plus net exports. From a previous uh, lecture, we know that national savings is defined as nominal GDP minus government expenditures minus consumption. So we can rewrite the identity on the top by saying that national savings equals to investment plus net exports. So what we see here is that national savings has to be equal to whatever we invest, again, and this is coming from the market for loanable funds, in a closed economy, but we're expanding it now to include the international capital markets. So let's think about this identity that I've written here on top. We can decompose this a little bit better. Uh, there's a lot that is going on in at exports. So let's think about it a little more. So savings, let's call it national savings, shall we? Let's, let's be a little bit more explicit. So national savings, equals, let's call it also national investment, plus, and let's think about what is going into net exports. Well, there's domestic purchases of foreign capital, minus foreign purchases of domestic capital. Okay, so let's think about names for each of those. Let's think about the first one again as foreign investment. And let's think about this as foreign savings. And notice that I'm not talking about foreign investment as investment that is being done, done by foreigners, but rather US foreign investment. So in terms of the foreign purchases of domestic capital, I will think about those as being foreign savings. So we can rewrite again our expression for national savings while taking these into account. And let's rewrite things a little bit differently. So on this end, let's put national savings and add to national savings foreign savings. That is equal to national investment plus foreign investment. So now you can see that when we think about both sides of capital flows, there is the collection of national savings done by locals and foreign savings done by the rest of the world. 
and that has to equal to the amount of investment done in the United States at the national level plus whatever flows uh, of investment happened abroad. So in this case, when we're separating it this way, we can see that those capital flows are being used to do investments locally or perhaps being used by the government or send, being sent abroad. So now let's think about the data. And here you see three series, one for investment. And if I may enhance that, let's call that national investment to correspond to what we did in the previous slide. And on the other one, let's call this national saving. Well, you see the gap between these two must be the net capital outflows. And net capital outflows are being uh, shown here on the green. Now, as you can see, in the 1960s up to 1980s, net capital outflow was averaging about 0%. From then on, the gap between national investment and national savings have been growing. Now, as you can see by the sign of the net capital outflows, that means that foreigners have been saving for us. Since investment has remained above saving, that means that all that capital from outside of the United States has been coming into the United States and being invested. And that's why we see that increasing gap between the two. Now, something worth mentioning is that these variables are flows. That means that this variable is the amount of money that is coming in or out in capital markets to the economy. And having negative net capital outflows over the last 30 years means that foreign investors have been purchasing more and more US assets than residents have purchased foreign assets during the same time. Over time, this trend means that more local assets are, are foreign owned as compared to foreign assets owned by US residents. At the end of 2019, the difference between asset ownership of US residents versus the rest of the world is $11 trillion. And that is what makes the US the world's largest borrower. So is the US trade deficit a national problem? Well, let's think about it. On one perspective here, um, we have a, a few phenomena. Around the world, there's been an increase in savings. And let's do a large money bag here. And that increase in savings, economists have called the savings glut. A lot of that capital has made its way to the United States because it is an attractive prospect for investment. But what makes the US so attractive to foreign investors, even at such low interest rates? Well, let's be really uh, loose here, but let's call it safety and tech. These two are important factors bringing foreign capital to the United States. The US government debt has the reputation of being one of the safest investment of the planet. At the same time, the US is home to the most innovative economic centers in the world. When looking at the numbers, US assets are generally considered less risky than other countries' assets. So the United States has been able to borrow from abroad at lower interest rates than it receives on its assets abroad. So, that means that when we put it in the balance, right, the interest income received from assets abroad and the interest expense of borrowing, total interest payments in the US compared to those interest payments to foreigners are no 
so much different. Even though U.S. owes foreigners a lot more money than foreigners owe the U.S. Hence, a multi-trillion dollar net debt is not much of the is not much of a drain on U.S. income. Well, at least not at this point. But that could change. As the U.S. debt continues to grow, foreigners may require higher interest rates to continue the supply uh, of capital to the United States. If so, servicing the U.S. net debt will become an increasing drain on future income. At the end, a country can go into debt for good or bad reasons. If the borrowing we're doing is invested in tech and other innovative sectors, the return on investment may surpass the cost of borrowing and in the end benefit U.S. companies and shareholders. If on the other hand, borrowing is used to finance consumption, that may not turn out so well.